The Tom Woods Show, episode 763. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, people who know me know I wear a lot of polo shirts, and they got to fit right, they got to be nice and comfy, and they got to have a collar that doesn't look like a crumpled up piece of bacon. It's got to be crisp and sharp. Well, check out Cricket Shirts and take 20% off your first order at Cricket, C-R-I-Q-U-E-T, shirts.com slash woods, and use promo code woods. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here with our final debate episode. Rather bittersweet, Lou Rockwell and I are going to be talking about the third presidential debate, and it's been fun, is all I can say. It's been entertaining. I will give them that. That's what we've gotten this year. Lou, of course, as my regular listeners know, is founder and chairman of the Mises Institute. He's been a chief of staff to Ron Paul. He publishes LouRockwell.com, which I order you, I order you to read every day, LouRockwell.com. And in particular, check out his blog and his political theater blog. In particular, he has two blogs. When you get there, you'll see links to these blogs. I look at political theater multiple times a day, and it... I, I find out a lot of stuff that I wouldn't have known otherwise, so it's super great. On this subject of whether Trump will accept the results and of the election, I dashed out a newsletter issue on that late last night because I, I was appalled at what I was seeing from <laughs> ABC News. So if you're not on my email list, you missed that little commentary, but you can jump on it while getting my brand new ebook, Education Without the State, over at nostateeducation.com. You get that free ebook, plus you get on my list for when I get upset. I send out an email to the list and I feel better. Lou, welcome to the show. Great to be with you, Tom. All right, let's do what we usually do. Give me your overall impressions, then we'll get into the weeds. Well, I think that, I think that Trump uh, won on points. I fear he needed to have a knockout. Um, there were, I think, a lot of opportunities that he didn't take. Um, but I was, I noticed, and I, by the way, I've noticed this before, the lighting always seems to be different for the two of them. There was one time when it turned out his mic was different and not as effective as her mic. But I thought last night it was especially clear that her, she was bathed in sort of uh, heavenly light. And the light that he is always in in these debates makes him look uh, pasty-faced and uh, um, just un slightly unhealthy. Whereas anytime you see him in one of his own rallies or in any other circumstance, he's got a ruddy, healthy complexion. So is that was that something intentional? Why, gosh, of course, the media would never do anything like that. She was um, – so I thought he looked a little bit off because of that. Uh, she had sort of a moon face, which I thought I've not quite seen before. I mean, it seemed like she, maybe she was on massive steroids. I, 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 I don't know. Uh, she, I thought she looked like Nurse Ratchet uh, from One Flies Over the Cuckoo Nest in her white nurse's outfit, her uh, uh, ordering you to the you know, electroshock therapy or whatever she would like to do to Trump and the rest of us. I thought that um, he had some good moments. I thought what he had to say, even though he didn't, he didn't follow up enough. For example, when she was claiming to be in favor of the Second Amendment, of course, that's just a lie. She doesn't, uh, she doesn't believe that there's an individual right to bear arms. She doesn't think regular Americans should be able to carry guns. But she just lied. She lied. She always lies, but she lied in sort of a Trumpian uh, – to sort of make herself uh, – to cut the distance between herself and Trump last night. Uh, he should have – he had some good – I thought some good comments about abortion, especially partial birth abortion. But he didn't go after her hard enough that – you know, that she – he didn't just actually describe what partial birth abortion is, that it's actually taking the baby as he put it just can be a couple hours before birth. He said ripped, ripping, ripping it out of the womb. Well, that's not it. It's killing the baby in the womb and then removing the parts. Uh, virtually nobody is for that. Um, I, thought he, I thought he was slightly weak on the question of what if the Supreme Court re repealed the, usurp the usurpation called Roe v. Wade and allowed this to return to the states. He, was, he said he was okay with that. I think that's, you know, as Ron Paulo was pointed out, that's the constitutional way. This something like abortion – if we're going to have government and we're going to have uh, so-called law enforcement, uh, these sorts of things need to be handled at the state. And if you if you got rid of Roe v. Wade, then places like New York and California would, of course, have abortion on demand. And in Alabama and Nebraska, you probably wouldn't. Um, but that's you – and know, then these things would be fought out at the state level. But I, he did – I think in these two – on these two issues, as in the rest of the time, he didn't really press her. There were times when he could have really gone after her more than he did. Uh, on the other hand, she looked alive. 
She didn't look like she was going to fall over, except maybe right towards some of the right towards the end. Uh, but he didn't call her on the lies when she when she's praising the greatness of the Clinton Foundation, and she said, "Why ninety percent of our donations go to charitable purposes? Well, it's actually six percent. It's not ninety <laughs> percent, unless you include her and Bill and and uh, Chelsea and so forth as uh, part of the charitable programs." So um, Trump was right to say the Haitians can't stand them, can't stand the Clintons because of what they did in Haiti. But he didn't. He, he just uh, time and time again, he didn't, he didn't follow through. I uh, I like the fact that he didn't agree to uh, that uh, recognize her if she quote unquote won the election. Al Gore, by the way, didn't recognize the Bush election until quite a while after because of the, the I think the, no question the election was stolen from him in Florida by the Republicans. He eventually recognized it. Uh, Richard Nixon is praised even by his enemies as having recognized the election of Kennedy, even though Kennedy stole the election or the Kennedy campaign stole the election with the help of uh, Mayor Daley in Chicago. Um, I think everybody agrees to that now that Kennedy actually didn't win that election in 1960. So I, I, I wish – because Trump had to know this question was coming. My, my own suggestion to him had I been in the room would have been to say – well, of course, I accept the election's results unless, of course, it's stolen. Yeah. <laughs> because, of course, I mean, uh, uh, rather than saying, well, he'll you know, decide later, which I thought was a slightly weaker answer. But as, as you pointed out in your wonderful uh, commentary last night, uh, uh, the entire media freaked out. It's almost as if they believe that in order for a candidate to win an election, the losing candidate has to concede. Of course, that's not true. Uh, it's, but it's, it's – uh, you're supposed to – Salam the system. There are certain pieties that you're supposed to go by in the uh, in the civil religion, and this is one of them. And the fact that I, I think it's I think it'd be wonderful if he if he loses, and my guess, unfortunately, he is going to lose, uh, that he will be a sort of a, a government in exile, and that he won't. Uh, and and I, ho- I think this is the Trump movement, no question. Which just as the the uh, uh, Goldwater movement was better than Goldwater and the Taft movement was better than Taft. So was the Trump movement far better than Donald Trump. Uh, but certainly the Trump people don't want him to accept her. And uh, I think it will be very good for the country if if there's real opposition to her uh, by all the people who think she's a liar, rightly so, think she's an extreme leftist. Um, she had all kinds of her crazy economic stuff and Trump – didn't seem quite on the ball. I mean, he kept referring to, so our, our GDP is 1%. Well, what he meant was, you know, GDP growth was 1%. Uh, and then he didn't have, you know, when the when uh, Chris Wallace, who I thought was um, let her go on and blab and cut him off uh, pretty handily uh, when he, and I don't remember the name of the organization. Well, Mr. Trump, the wise men who uh, look at the economy and the deficit organization uh, says that su- such and such about you and such and such about Hillary. He should have just said, you know, they're just a bunch of liberals. Why should I take their word about anything? Yeah. But of course, there's many times like of that he could have come back. It's not being me. He could have. It's not being rude. But it's a good question. I mean, <laughs> a lot of good questions he could have been asking. So um, he didn't lose. Uh, his demeanor, if that's what they always tell us is so important, uh, was quote-unquote presidential, therefore less effective, I think. Um, she didn't fall down, didn't fall asleep. Uh, she was clearly pumped up on something. Uh, they really took care of her face. She's, she has a turkey neck like a lot of people uh, uh, that age. What happened to that turkey? It's gone. It was gone last night. So there are obviously all kinds of Hollywood techniques where they tape back your throat and – tape back your face and hide everything under your hair and so forth. And she had, she had all that. She looked um, good, although extremely scary. I mean, a very repellent figure, I would say. Uh, I kept thinking uh, she should have been in a black witch's costume with a black hat and a black dress. Uh, she would have, uh, you know, just looked, ex- again, Cruella de Vil as a witch. So um, I, I, uh, her, her hysterical stuff about Russia – a country with a GDP the size of Italy is somehow taking over the world, and and of course she imme- rather than deal with the, the contents of the of the WikiLeaks leaks, um, she just immediately is uh, going back to 1955 and the most crazy uh, Cold War rhetoric. So it's it's uh, did that work? Uh, I don't know. It did get said, of course, that 
She's for open borders. She told the, the Brazilian bankers group uh, that she heard this was her dream, open borders from Terra del de Friego to, uh, to the Arctic Circle. And uh, so she said, oh, no, she's not for open borders. Uh, she meant for electricity and other forms of energy. Oh, I, you know, I mean, that had to be one of the, her weakest lies. Trump didn't come back. He didn't come back, you know, you know there's uh, – countries share electricity right now. You don't need to – that doesn't need to be your dream about uh, uh, energy sharing. So that was – I thought, you know, he did OK. Uh, he didn't – I don't think do, – he didn't do well enough to win, the, to win the debate in a really convincing fashion. Uh, also, just as one last point, Tom, I noticed as in previous debates, she's reading something off her, off her podium. I mean, reading, and of course, it's against the rules to bring anything written up to the podium. You can make notes, but she was reading long, long stretches of uh, material f from the podium. What, what was that? Some people think she had some kind of uh, teleprompter the last time. You know, I, I don't know, but I wish, I wish uh, Trump had said, um, Mrs. Clinton or Hillary, uh, are you reading something off your podium? Or, or I mean, wh what was going on there? Uh, she can't have had time to write in longhand all the stuff she was reading. What, once in a while, you could see her making a note. That's that's a normal thing. Um, so I think I think uh, the fix was in. I think she had the questions ahead of time, just like she has in the had in the previous two debates. I thought Chris Wallace was biased against Trump, but perhaps not as biased as as, as some of the others. Um, you know, you're grateful if you're not kicked in the face, I guess, these days with the media. But it, it's um, – I found the whole thing extremely annoying, uh, frequently boring. Uh, it should have been scintillating. It should have been sizzling. Trump could have made it sizzle. Uh, once in a while, he turned the heat up a little bit, but uh, not enough. Yeah, let me let's jump in on a couple things you mentioned. Uh, well, first of all, even if she didn't have anything at her disposal at the podium – what she did have was debate preparation. She knew at least the broad questions that were going to be asked the same way he did. But the fact is she has prepared responses. Now, they're canned. They're stupid. You know, we need to invest in jobs by <laughs> blowing money on projects no one in his right mind would ever fund. You know, I grant you that those aren't good responses, but she was ready. Yes. And as usual, he's bumbling around and he's Donald Trump, so he can just speak off the cuff. He has an inflated sense of his own abilities. He can't speak off the cuff. He sounds terrible. He sounds unconvincing when he does that. Secondly, what is the biggest weapon the state has against us? It's actually not its weaponry and its technology. It's legitimacy. It's the idea that people think it's okay for them to rip us off and blow up people in other countries and to do all these things because they're legitimate, that this is, right. you know, these people have been chosen by us and they have legitimacy. So it's great, even if Trump doesn't get Rothbardianism, if he's undermining the legitimacy of the regime by saying he's not so sure he'll accept the results, that is an absolutely unambiguously good thing from a libertarian point of view. So I was very disappointed to be f flipping through my Twitter feed, uh, I beg your pardon, my Facebook feed last night, and to see libertarians saying, oh, it's terrible that he won't accept that. <laughs> what? This is exactly what we're calling for. We want people, we want everybody to not accept anybody. That's what, so we're halfway there. You know, if they're not accepting the de rule by the Democrats, we're halfway there, as Ron Paul would say in another context. So that's not his pro the problem. The problem is that too few people will take that view, that, that most people will just stand around and say, yeah, I guess uh, we got to accept it. W why? W what is – there's nothing legitimate about any of these people in any sense. So if he's willing to say maybe some portion of the regime is illegitimate, that, then that means he's at least part of the way there. And then finally on your point about he won't hit back, well, I agree. But in particular, if there's an issue where Hillary is not responding to – to Trump's attacks, that means she's vulnerable. That's where you hit. And so, for instance, he kept mentioning that the Democrats were the ones who were inciting violence, for example, in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And he kept hitting her with that. You're, you're the one who was behind the violence. You notice she didn't say a word. At that point, when she doesn't say a word, you then turn and ask her a pointed question. You say, do you approve of the use of violence against my people? And why were the people who call for the violence, why are they so 
intimately related to you and Barack Obama. I want an answer to this question, and if she doesn't answer this question, I expect our impartial media to hound her with this between now and election day. (laughs) And if they do, then I'll accept the results. You know, nothing. He let her get away, even though she wasn't answering, which meant he got her. Ask her the question. Make her face that. No, and also, I mean, I uh, t- 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 thinking about legitimacy, and uh, David Gordon wrote a wonderful little essay that's on LouRockwell.com about – he always makes the point that nobody makes an argument for anything. But he says in all the, in all the political science literature, uh, ancient and modern, there is no argument about why the majority should rule. Why, why should the majority be able to rule? Let's say even if, even if Hillary gets the majority – why are they able to crush the minority? I mean, what what is the argument for that? And, and, and as David said, there is no good, there's no argument, there's no good argument except um, just uh, that it's just self evident. They would claim. Well, of course, it's not self evident. And um, I urge, urge everybody to to look at the Della Buetti's article, B O E T I E uh, article, and a great introduction by Murray Rothbard uh, on the whole the importance of legitimacy to the state. It can actually take down the state. The state. Mises made this point, uh, Hume made this point, because Rothbard made this point. The state requires the consent of the governed, at least the tacit consent. And successful states, which are successful in doing, of course, great evil, uh, have the tacit – even Stalin and Hitler had the tacit consent of the people. Um, if, you can, if you can undermine that consent, that is such a huge uh, blow against statism, against tyranny – uh, so this is, as you, as you point out, this was actually the best thing. On the other hand, I think he should have talked about it a little bit. He, again, he could have talked about the Al Gore. So they, the election was stolen from Al Gore. That would have been a shocking point for a, a Republican to make. Uh, but, you know, he, he, as you say, he, I mean, did he have any preparation whatsoever? I, I don't know. He, he, of course, didn't mention the Fed again if we're talking about the economy. And um, – I don't know. It's it's this whole thing is one big lost opportunity. On the other hand, he came out of nowhere. Uh, he's had um, unprecedented uh, official hatred from the very beginning. He won the primaries, smashed all his opponents, and uh, you know has done reasonably well against this vast machine. The sad thing is, uh, you know, he he could have done better. On the other hand, maybe we're better off with Clinton in power, especially if she's being undermined. Because uh, of course, none of us can be entirely sure what tr- what Trump would do. Uh, would he actually uh, do the good things he's talked about, or would he not? So uh, uh, maybe I'm just uh, putting lipstick on the pig. But um, no, I've thought the same thing, Lou. Because for one thing, I mean, just as one small thing, they cannot cannot by 2020 still be blaming Bush for the bad economy. And, and of course, it's not that was all bipartisan. There's nothing Bush did. I mean, the tax cuts were not a, that big of a deal. I mean, what, four and a half percentage points oh, on no, the top yeah, rates? Small, I mean, yeah, yeah like yeah. That, that led us to a recession. Makes no sense. But um, they all favored the stimulus to the housing market. They all favored the Fed's policies. It had nothing yes. to do with Bush in particular. It was all of them. But they can't continue to pretend that it has nothing to do with the Democrats after 12 years. So so there, there is that. Uh, so I mean, there, there are some potential silver linings to a uh, Hillary Clinton presidency and from that point of view, from the point of view of a libertarian. Uh, let's go back and look. From I, I took some notes in order of the issues that were raised. One of the questions was where do you, it was it ended with where do you want to see the Supreme Court take the country? And I thought, boy, does that beg the question? And I, <laughs> I, I recently went on a tear about the meaning of the term "beg the question," and I had trouble coming up with a really good example of what the real meaning of beg the question is. That begs the question. That begs the question that the Supreme Court's supposed to take the country somewhere. I mean, the idea that you would have asked James Madison, where do you want to see the Supreme Court take the country? He wouldn't even understood the question. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, the Supreme Court is not supposed to take the country anywhere. And then Clinton gives this blah, blah, blah. The Supreme Court should represent all of us. Supreme Court is not a representative body. It doesn't even make sense. How should the Constitution be interpreted? We didn't really get an answer from Clinton other than, well, in light of my policy preferences. That's, of course, how it should be interpreted. Now, Trump, you know, stumbled around and eventually got to, well, we should interpret it the way the founders wanted it interpreted, which is something. But it was very inarticulate, took him forever. And his first answer was all about the Second Amendment, which, you know, I, I get that he wants to rally the Republican base, but but he focused so much on the Second Amendment. D- doesn't he have a judicial philosophy? Doesn't he have any? It, it was just way too much on that. Then, then he did pro life again, obviously signaling to the GOP. I get that he's got to do that, but he could have done that also 
by just saying, well, I I don't believe the point of the Supreme Court is to implement Hillary Clinton's policy preferences when people vote them down. How about saying that? <laughs> Nothing. No preparation. And then when he when it got to the Second Amendment, he's basically got these, as usual, substance-free responses. She was very upset about Heller, she, she, and, and so on and on. But wh- why not have some statistics at your disposal? Like, he did have Chicago. He said Chicago's a, a nightmare, and yet it's got very heavy gun regulations. But man... I mean, there is John Lott. There are people who have all these statistics that you could just rattle off when she's talking about all the deaths from guns. You could talk about all the deaths that were prevented by guns. You, you gotta, for heaven's sake, you gotta have all this stuff prepared, especially when they're going to come at you with you don't even want regulations on these terrible weapons. You've <laughs> got to have that. You've got to know that's coming. You've got to have responses ready. And I just, I felt like he didn't have them. No, no. And when when Chris Wallace said, uh, you, you know, you don't you don't want to do anything about assault. Weapons And, of course, he could have said, look, assault weapon is just a name for a look of a gun. It's just a hunting rifle gussied up. An assault weapon is no more dangerous than just a regular uh, deer hunting rifle. This is just a, this is a myth of uh, Hillary Clinton and similar people who want to outlaw gun ownership by regular Americans. They just want the government being the only one to have guns. Uh, and so, the, you know, that's – but you're right. I mean, I, I – I, I wondered if you were – just how right you were the last time when you talked about his not being prepared. But boy, last night, Tom, showed your thesis exactly correct. Um, what was he doing all this time? I mean he could have been reading. He could have been – he didn't have to have mock debates, although you know, that would, would, if, if he didn't feel he needed them. He should have been reading. The, he should have been talking to people. Yeah, and he could, he could have had a, a, you know, a briefing book and it and, uh, doesn't have to be 900 pages. But just – Missed opportunity after missed opportunity uh, once he became the nominee. And um, I mean, he did okay for a guy in, in with no political experience and so forth. But uh, And I worry too. I mean, I think there's no question that the economy is going to be much worse. There's no question that many, many things are going to be much worse after an additional four years of Obama, Clinton, as he would put it. Um, but I don't know. What about What about all the refugees? You know, she's wanting to bring in she wanted to vastly up uh, the number of refugees coming into this country and uh, living off the fat of the land, by the way, when they come here. They get all sorts of welfare that uh, – uh, and I'm not for anybody getting welfare, but they get welfare that all sorts of – that regular Americans can never be eligible for. And I just wish once in a while when, you know, when somebody says, we're a nation of immigrants, he says, you know, we're, we're actually a nation of people born here. Yes, there are immigrants. But, you know, it's about time that somebody put the American people first. We're going to put America first. We're going to put the American people first. I don't have any ill feeling towards foreigners. But you know what? They come second. Americans come first. If you get Hillary Clinton, she's going to have Syrian refugees first. She doesn't care about the people who were born in Minneapolis or, or New York City or Miami or, or in uh, New Mexico or whatever. She doesn't – and uh, she's, she's – uh, I mean all this crazed – uh, immigrationism, uh, xenophilia, uh, Sorosianism, whatever we want to call it, um, is is in part about, and I think there are other more more uh, darker reasons too. But it's in part to make sure that no decent candidate can ever win a presidential election again. There are already going to be many, many of these illegal aliens voting in this election. This is why they are bringing them all in. At least one reason. This is what they hope to achieve. Who knows what this country is going to be like after four years? Maybe we're going to be like Germany or France. Uh, we're bringing in all kinds of people, giving them giving them uh, affirmative action and welfare and all kinds of special benefits and special privileges and really also uh, making them immune in many ways from uh, the laws that the rest of us are forced to uh, comply with. It's, 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 it's doing terrible demographic things to this country. People want to change the American people. This is what this whole – uh, open borders business is about. It's backed by all the oligarchs, whether it's people like Soros or Charles Koch, or uh, they they all have their reasons for doing this. Uh, I think very very nasty, evil reasons. But this is of course should have been Trump's signature issue. Sort of has been. He didn't drive it home last night. Yeah, I was just going to say, if you're going to run a campaign based in large part on an issue. And then they take 15 minutes to talk about that issue and you allow yourself to get sidetracked on other things, then you really are as undisciplined as they say. This is your issue and this is one where 
the fact is the polls show he's more popular than she is. On that issue, most people, you know, like in Japan, they have basically no immigration and nobody reproaches himself saying I'm an evil racist for not <laughs> wanting it. I mean, this is just this is just normal people. That's how that's how basically normal people act. All right, I want to I, I want to get into a, f- a few more specifics uh, and things where he may have actually landed a punch and things where he, he might have. Let's say a quick word of thanks to our sponsor. Folks, I know this will come as a shock, but I actually am rather particular about a lot of things. And one of them is when I go out, I want to look reasonably well put together. When I'm wearing a polo shirt, I want it to look like the old style, like Arnold Palmer would have worn or Jack Nicholas. And that's what the Cricut shirt is. They've created a mix of old school style and modern design. I love these shirts because they feel great. I almost want people to come touch them. But on the other hand, if you run into me, keep your mitts off my shirt. But the fit is right. They're not too baggy. They're not too skinny. But the key thing for me is the collar. That's what makes you look sharp. And usually the collar gets all scrunched up and it looks terrible. And you don't want that. You want to look well put together. So they've got removable collar stays in their collars. So I look like the master of the universe, and no one can quite put his finger on exactly why. That's how I like it. Well, get 20% off your first order at cricketshirts.com. That's C-R-I-Q-U-E-T shirts.com slash woods, and use promo code woods at checkout. All right, I thought he did he did get a few things in, you know, he, we can't continue to pay for the defense of country after country. Mm -hmm. And then she was saying, Oh, our, our allies are wonderful. And then he basically translated that. (laughs) Yeah. That means you're going to let them continue to be freeloaders. You know, that doesn't help to just say how wonderful they are all the time. It doesn't, doesn't help. But then when the issue came to women, yeah, I know his handlers, even Trump's handlers are probably telling him, you got to be really careful here. But you know, why doesn't he accuse, why doesn't he bring up her role in trying to destroy Bill's accusers. I mean, yeah, it's not her fault that Bill's a, a you know a jerk. I mean, maybe she should have known it when she married him. Who knows? But that's not strictly her fault. But it is her fault that she tried to completely destroy these women. Why? Why? I mean, I can't believe that was that should have been obvious. I, I, unbelievable! Unbelievable that he didn't do that. Yeah, that's. I mean, he's got as at least an informal, occasional. Uh, sort of advisor, Roger Stone, who knows everything there is to know about everything ever done to any of these women. And nothing? In fact, there was some uh, new uh, rape accuser of Bill Clinton's who was there last night. I apologize, I'm not remembering her name. But somebody had never mentioned this for all these years and and, uh, talked about it. How about pointing out that she's in the audience? Or I would have have made some, taken some opportunity to point out that the president's half brother was in the audience with a "Make America Great Again" hat. <laughs> you know, why would I not do that? <laughs> so, and and I read an article, a breathless article in the media, trying to explain this. You know, well, they have a rivalry, the two of them, and the other. You know, the, and plus, Trump wouldn't want this guy to immigrate anyway, and all that. But. I, I would have absolutely. I would have made an ad with this guy. Why not? At least one of his super PACs should make an yeah, ad with this guy. Of course, I'm the president's brother, and I'm sorry it hasn't worked out. But I'll tell you how to make America great again. I'm t- that's what I would have done. I think. I think that's crazy. Um, it, it was good that when she accused Trump of inciting violence, that he pointed out, well, but you're the one who actually paid people <laughs> to go out there and be violent. I mean, there there is something called glass houses and, and so on. The other thing I thought where he he did hit her was. Uh, why don't you give the money back to Saudi Arabia yes. and all these oppressive regimes yeah. that hurt all the official victim groups you claim to protect? And all she could do was <laughs> smile through that. So what? It's funny that people get their heads chopped off. Like that, you find that funny? And in fact, that, in fact, that's what I would have said. I would have said, "Well, hold, yeah. hold on a minute. Hold on. Do you realize the horrific nature of these regimes and what's done to dissenters there? Do you find this funny? What? What on earth is funny about that?" Tom, you should have been running. <laughs> I would have hated every second of it, Lou. I would have enjoyed the debates, and I would have gone right back to hating every second of it. All right, what, and then I thought he had a, you know, obviously she had a canned closing statement, even though they had said there would be no closing statements. She's always got one. But again, that's because she's a good politician. I mean, let's let's give her her due. She's good at it. She's prepared for things like that. And he just, me- his, his start to the closing statement made no sense. Yeah. And then he just meandered, and it was slogans, and that was it. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, your moment to look into the camera and say, if you're happy with how things are going, if you're happy with your job or your lack of job, if you're happy with this trend, that trend, that trend, that trend, lunatics in charge of everything, uh, 
a party that thinks it can win by intimidation. If you're if you're a, a media, you know, if you're happy being told how to vote by a completely corrupt media, then by all means, vote for her. Vote for that smirking grandma next to me. Vote for her. Yeah, <laughs> vote for that. Vote for the woman who collapsed into her van and think that she's going to be able to accomplish anything. You you vote for her. But if, if you want to give a middle finger to the whole establishment, yeah, don't tell the pollsters you're going to do it. Don't tell your family you're going to do it. But when you get in that voting booth, you know what to do. Now, that would have been a great closing statement. <laughs> that might have won him the election. I wish, you know, come on, right? I mean, just for the fun of it, somebody's got to say something like this. Just for, Somebody take notes here. Like, just, just for my amusement, I want to see something like this. But man, 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 I don't know why we are cond- – I mean, on the other hand, if, if it had been Ted Cruz, he is more a more technically skilled debater, but yet he has – I don't know. I just feel like he has kind of the creep factor that she has, and that slightly neutralizes him. He doesn't seem real. He seems like he rehearsed every five-second, much-too-long pause. He rehearsed everything, and that kind of ruins it also. You know, you remind me that there are some good things we haven't heard from Ted Cruz in a long time. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, no, we sure haven't, and, and I think he's not been quite sure what to do. He knows that he had to endorse Trump because he made a mistake by not endorsing him. And then Trump got in trouble, and then he's thinking, oh, maybe I made a mistake by endorsing him after not endorsing him. Ah, I'm glad I'm not involved in any of this. I can just sit back and watch. Although, because his father had said he was anointed by Jesus Christ to be the president. Yeah, yeah, we do have that. uh, Yeah, yeah. there is that. I was mentioning on yesterday's episode that with the debates over, you know, there goes our fun, but yet I think— you know, on your blog, you keep up with current events more than I mean, I'm able to keep up with current events. Thanks to you, basically. Thanks to you, Matt Drudge and a few other people. I, you know, I have to take Drudge with a grain of salt sometimes, but I'm able to more or less keep up with current events. But maybe we could regularly just discuss what's going on in the world. Do like a podcast episode of your political theater from time to time. No, I, I would love to do it. And I think there, whatever happens, and I'm not, by the way, 100% sure Trump is going to lose. Uh, but I've got uh, a great article today by Chris Mannion on how Hillary can steal the election if Trump wins it. Oh, I read Talking that. about and things that could be with the Electoral College and so forth. Yeah, that sounded entirely plausible. All they need to do is get some so-called experts on TV. Uh, all they need to do is get a certain – I mean, it's the same way – If he wins, she's not just going to accept it and say, well, it's the people's will. There we go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's the same – but it'll just be by – over and over and over again, emphasizing, well, you know, the electors can vote their consciences or whatever. They just say it over and over and over. The same way, this is my favorite example of this. How in the world did Elizabeth Dole ever get viewed as an interesting candidate for the Republican nomination? Like no one, I mean, Bob Dole was bad enough. How did she ever get, and the answer was, her name kept getting floated by major people on the Sunday talk shows. It wasn't because there was a groundswell of support for Elizabeth Dole. There was nothing, which is why she never went anywhere. But they just keep hammering home at something, and before you know it, people are saying, well, you know, I hear that Elizabeth Dole has a lot to be said for, you know, or I sure, I hear that Saddam Hussein sure is a dangerous fellow. These things just pick up a life of their own. I could easily see that happening, uh, what Chris Mannion was saying. So... Yeah, check out LouRockwell.com. Read, read Chris Mannion uh, for what could be in store uh, if, if Trump wins. Anyway, regardless of what's in store, you and I will be talking about it, and that'll be my favorite part. Tom, thanks a million for having me on, and thanks so much for all our uh, debate autopsies, and it's been a huge amount of fun. I feel like there should be a YouTube montage, you know, with, with sad <laughs> music in the background, people crying. <laughs> you know, so we'll, see. we'll see what people can do with that. Thanks, Lou. Thank you, Tom. All right, I think there's something I need to tell you about a website I promoted the other day by one of my listeners, oh-cs.com. It's otherhandcomicstrips.com, and it's a libertarian webcomic. Well, i telling you I didn't know until today that about a month ago, one of their comic strips ran something like this. It's two people talking, and one of them says, well, how do I persuade somebody to abandon socialism? or that socialism is wrong. And the other person says, I don't know, wait for the socialist state to collapse. And the other person says, well, is there anything faster? And then the other person says, get them to debate Tom Woods on Twitter. That's very sweet. I appreciate that. But on the other hand, don't encourage me. I need to be spending less time on Twitter. I get drawn into these arguments, and they take up a lot of time, although I sometimes find them to be good fodder for emails and articles. So that is at least something. So I I wanted you to know there is actually a funny... Uh, strip that actually involves me. 
on that site. So I want to mention that. Also, brand new blog by a listener. And this one, I really love the, the writing level. The quality of it is top notch. And as you know, I don't say that very freely. The site is AppliedCynicism.com. Yes, that is an excellent name, AppliedCynicism.com. And on the About page, one of the paragraphs reads as follows, In a world built on manipulation and deception, cynicism is vital. Cynicism is an agent of accountability, the first and last line of defense. Cynicism lays bare the lies, obfuscations, and bureaucratic entanglements that exist to divert your attention from the true motives of those who lust for power. And here, cynicism is applied directly to the forehead of the overclass with a sledgehammer. So all kinds of topics covered. If you're a libertarian, you're going to love this blog. So check out AppliedCynicism.com. I'll link to it as the listener website mentioned at TomWoods.com slash 763. A shout out like this, plus a link from my site, which Google loves, which will help your search engine optimization, plus some tutorials, plus membership in my private self-help or mutual help bloggers group. All that is yours if you check out TomWoods.com slash publicity and get your hosting through my link. All right, tomorrow we're talking gambling on the show with a professional poker player who is also a libertarian, and he tells me this is actually a very rare thing. So looking forward to that. See you then. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.